as you have realized, I'm kind of outsider. Uh, I'm not a social scientist, I'm a biologist. And um, open science and science 2.0, uh, in this case, I'm an independent researcher. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, a department or the faculty uh, uh, devoted to, to the study of uh, open science. Uh, you know, uh, there's this tradition that uh, um, people speaking at the conferences at the beginning, they thank the organizers. I really want to do that, but um, this requires a bit of explanation. Um, over the last roughly 10 years, when I was uh, listening and participating in the discussion on Science 2.0, which back then happened mainly in the US and UK, um, I had this uh, um, uh, recurring experience that when the beautiful idea, the brilliant idea, is turned some, into something much less stellar. Um, for example, Daniel Mitchin, who had a workshop uh, on Tuesday and was chairing the, one of the sessions yesterday, uh, had this beautiful idea, science as a wiki, which has a lot of um, ideas behind uh, in terms of evolution of uh, scholarly publishing process. And this was, in the course of years, turned into the notion that um, scientists should use wikis as their laboratory notebooks. This is much simpler, but um, it doesn't capture the, the, the original idea. Uh, the other example was John Udall's um, phrase from 2007, data find data, then people find people. Um, this captures the, the idea that at some point uh, people will start scientific collaborations not because of um, physical proximity, not, of, not because of informal communication, but because of compatibility of the data they produced. This was again turned into uh, the notion that scientists should use uh, blogs, uh, social media and wikis because this will increase the citation rate. Uh, so it's not like that, that the, uh, this Anglosphere community is not smart. It's homo homogenic and it's monolinguistic. Uh, it lacks really the, um, uh, the fresh air and close pro cross-pollination of ideas. Therefore, I'm really happy we are having this conversation outside, not without, outside of Anglosphere for the first time. Thank you to the organizers, for, to Professor Tochtenmann for organizing this conference. Uh, okay, being nice, checked. Uh, uh, this is the official definition uh, of Science 2.0. Uh, it's about investigation of how social media change research and publication processes. This is wrong. Uh, not fundamentally wrong, but largely wrong. Uh, it unnecessarily focuses on, uh, on tools, not on the philosophy, not on the processes. I would like to offer an alternative definition. Science 2.0 is really about opening informal communication between scientists themselves and between, what's important, between scientists and the general public. This is an element of a larger process called open science. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, somebody uh, mentioned that what connects science 2.0 is uh, with citizen science are the tools. Uh, to me, it was quite obvious that the person saying these words didn't participate in any citizen science project ever. Uh, Galaxy uh, Zooniverse platform, uh, which uh, has uh, citizen science projects uh, that gather together over a million participants, is just a simple web, uh, web service without almost at all informal communication. There is no Facebook over there. Um, the other example folded, uh, this is a game where people from all over the world are uh, manually folding protein structures. This is a game. There's no Facebook, Twitter or whatsoever. There's no informal communication in there. In citizen science project at that scale, um, you don't really want to open up 
um, uh, informal communication with uh, half a million participants. Uh, uh, for the rest of your uh, life, you will be answering Twitter requests. Uh, so what's connecting uh, uh, Science 2.0 with open access, with uh, open data, uh, with citizen science is the philosophy of openness. Uh, and as such, uh, Science 2.0 is a fuel, not a mechanism. This, this is something which will fuel a couple of trends I will briefly uh, talk about uh, now. Um, uh, openness uh, is somehow um, compatible and uh, very correlated with uh, globalization. And um, we are not often aware how science is global compared to the rest of the world. Uh, if you look at all trans-border communication um, of a real, the whole world, uh, only 1% of um, mm, uh, physical email, only 2% of phone calls, and only 17% of internet traffic crosses national borders. Only 17% of, of internet traffic. This is extremely small. Uh, uh, you need to account for the fact that Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter do not have their servers in each country. This is extremely small. The, I don't have statistics for um, uh, for science. Uh, in biomedical field, it's quite obvious that uh, almost 100% of internet traffic is international. Uh, I'm not sure about social sciences, but uh, another interesting metrics is the, um, the average sum of physical distances between co-authors of the same publication. Over the last 30 years, it increased fivefold. We are global compared to the rest of the world. And as such, we have um, reasonable expectations about what, uh, what communication should look like. Um, imagine ger German highways and imagine what would happen if the government uh, would shut down uh, the highways in a such way that they are open only two days a week and to a car uh, with, uh, only with a certain color. The angry drivers would, uh, would immediately dis dismiss such a government. Uh, open science is not really about some moral principles, but it's about convenience and reasonable expectation what should scholarly communications look like. Uh, in other words, we don't go, we stopped going to libraries not because we don't like librarian. It's because uh, we like the convenience of having uh, the whole library at our disposal, at our desks. Therefore, openness, uh, as Neely Cross uh, correctly stated, uh, is unstoppable trend because of the convenience and the speed uh, it provides to us. Uh, the second thing, and this is going to be really funny, uh, is the evolution of uh, uh, research assessment. Uh, you all know that research assessment uh, is one of the major forces shaping science. Uh, but it's not only about the fact that scientists will dance to the tunes um, funders, uh, funders play. Uh, there, there are some uh, cultural biases uh, embedded in the research uh, assessment systems all over the world. Uh, some of them are qu uh, quite local. Um, this, this difference between question first and data first um, approaches is very visible be uh, as a distinction between uh, genomics research in US and uh, in continental Europe. Uh, for example, um, almost 10 years ago uh, when the DNA sequencing uh, was still very expensive, Craig Venter got the grant for going a, a trip around, around the world uh, he was collecting samples from the ocean and he was sequencing all the DNA he could find uh, in, that, in that samples. Uh, what for? Just to collect the data. Um, back then, I doubt he would be funded by any European funding agency. Uh, 
uh, back then, uh, uh, it was quite easy to uh, individually assess um, uh, research output of a scientist because half of the researchers were work, working at Oxford, the other uh, half at Cambridge. Everybody knew each other and uh, everybody was reading uh, their own papers. Uh, it's not the case anymore, not only, not only the number of scientists uh, increased, but the number of research outputs per scientist as well. And uh, where does the new come from? Uh, uh, there's a certain uh, illegibility attached to a modern scientist uh, in a sense that he, his social status is not really uh, well defined. I will explain that in a minute. But also um, this publish or perish policy um, dramatically influenced uh, um, the way people are uh, producing uh, uh, research. I said producing, this is not really um, a research anymore, but producing research. Um, what I mean by illegibility, um, there's this famous cartoon by Peter Steiner uh, from 1993 on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Let's move it forward. On the internet, nobody cares if you're a professor. Your status becomes illegible. And um, uh, imagine a situation that two old German professors are having a conversation during uh, our coffee break, and what, is, what are the chances that the young PhD student will join the conversation? Almost zero. Uh, if they are having this conversation uh, in the public forum on the internet, the, the chances are much higher. The professor, these professors lost their st social status on the internet. And uh, uh, when it comes to research assessment, we are extremely attached to the notion of legibility. And le let me just give you a funny example. Uh, in 2008, when there was a research assessment exercise in the UK, if you didn't have uh, a permanent position at the university or um, uh, at research institution, you, your papers did not count toward, towards the, uh, the output of the institution. Uh, you are on a fixed term. You could leave. That's strange. You're, uh, we don't know how to proceed with you. Um, so uh, we have an illegible research, researcher with a large number of um, research outputs, and we need to somehow assess uh, such a person. There, therefore, we seek for additional supporting data. And uh, you probably uh, know about all of these ideas um, uh, very well. We count citations, squared semantic citations uh, are going to, introduce, going to be introduced shortly. Reuses, profiles in social media, um, Facebook likes, metrics, retweets, uh, also real life impact, um, uh, cultural impact mentions in new, uh, traditional newspaper, newspapers and so on, and increasing increasing number of funders tries to capture uh, this data real time because it's quite convenient and you can actually draw the line if the researcher is developing, uh, is growing uh, or if, if the grow is stalled or so would. And uh, the third thing uh, is not that, um, it's not that trivial but you probably f uh, heard about this many times, uh, although in a quite a different context, is so-called algorithmic governance. It's not like that that we are handing the decisions to computers, we are handing them to algorithms. This can be uh, written uh, uh, into paper, such as laws and so on, but it, it ca they can be written into software algorithms. So um, these are not meant to uh, automate things, but to remove remove human error from the from from the decision. And uh, I'm not sure how does it look uh, in Germany, but in Poland, for example, if uh, the final exam at the end of secondary school uh, decides on your admission at the universities. This also happens in um, uh, in states. In transplantology, the donor patient matching is also completely automated. For, for the purpose of speed and for the purpose of remo removing human error. Google search engine rankings, that's 
absolutely obvious for everyone, but also uh, Wikipedia uh, in an increasing fashion uses bots, not only for automated correction of, uh, of uh, web pages, of, of wiki pages, but also for uh, granting rights to certain users based on their behavior. And uh, let's go back one step uh, to, to research metrics. Um, uh, th th this quote calls, comes for Guardian, and I'm, uh, I'm not really sure whether these predictions um, uh, are right or not. That, it doesn't really matter. I followed the, uh, the, the, the story and the conversation around the story for, um, uh, for one reason. Uh, there's um, science, technology, engineering, and medicine will be assessed using statistical indicators, no such metrics. Um, arts human, uh, will be judged by old methods of peer review, informed by metrics. And there's actually a funny thing that uh, almost no one objected to the first, uh, to the first proposal, that such a diverse area of science will be assessed using universal central metrics. Uh, why is that? Because people are aware that uh, if you construct such a metrics and you start building a, um, uh, some kind of algorithmic governance based on, that, based on that, you need to introduce several exceptions. Because um, if you compare two fields such as ecology and cancer research, not only the pattern of citations uh, is completely different, but the impact is different, everything is different. Uh, we would uh, uh, as well compare uh, social sciences with uh, cancer research. That's kind of pointless, therefore, uh, we will introduce several exceptions to, uh, to these metrics, making them more complex. Um, where are the social media here? Um, because um, uh, that's more easy to capture. They serve, of course, as a medium uh, uh, in terms of globalization and openness. Uh, they introduce pressure on the evolution of a uh, research process to be included in that process. But also they serve as data source for algorithmic governance. Um, Change always is. We are in the middle of that process, so where we are heading. And uh, here are the good, the bad, and the ugly about Science 2.0. Mm, the good. Um, there are several consequences. And um, what I like a lot is an increase in massively collaborative projects. Um, you probably heard. Uh, about uh, Polymath project, team goers a couple of years ago um, tried to assess whether massively collaborative mathematics is possible. Mathematicians typically work alone. He wanted to say to check if uh, if massively collaborative uh, mathematics is possible. Uh, he invented the problem, asked people on his blog. Uh, a month later. Uh, with the help of almost 30 mathematicians all over the world. Uh, he solved the problem uh, in a more generic fashion that he assessed would take him uh, at least half a year, if not more. Uh, we will see increase uh, uh, in number of such projects, especially uh, uh, especially in areas uh, of science which, which are kind of interdisciplinary. Uh, the other thing is that we will see an emergence of complex super projects. If you, see, if you think that human genome project was um, uh, complex, uh, it was not. It was large, it was huge, it was massively parallel, but uh, basically everybody involved in that project, knew from the very beginning, from the collecting of the samples to the analysis and assembly, they knew what's going on. In case of Large Hadron Collider, uh, that wasn't the case anymore. Uh, the scope of the projects was so wide that people who were uh, designing cooling system had no idea about Higgs boson. 
we will see an emergence uh, of such complex super projects as well. And uh, the last thing is, uh, this is an increased efficiency of research assessment. And uh, here I would like to point out the direction of uh, research done by Daniel Mitchin. Uh, with uh, open peer review, there was, a there, there was a commentary in Nature published three years ago uh, about open grant proposals. Uh, the things that uh, we are complaining about peer review in journals could be easily addressed um, uh, through certain kind of open peer review. Uh, the bad things. Uh, before I go to the consequences, uh, I need to point out one, one more thing. Um, this real-time assessment, this immediacy of research assessment, uh, forces people to increase the speed of publishing. But uh, if you are putting the papers out, which are close to minimal publishable unit, you cannot, uh, this is your lowest hanging fruit, you cannot speed that anymore. So the, the salami slices times, are, uh, the times of publishing salami slices are pretty much over. We are going to see an increase um, of research outputs uh, from ad hoc, uh, very intensive and very short term collaborations. It's the fruit which you can get the fastest, not the lowest uh, hanging fruit is going to shape uh, our uh, publishing uh, habits. Therefore, long-term projects um, are not going to thrive uh, in such an environment. And also the number of middle-sized, let's say around 20 people, research groups will go down. Uh, such a large group, which is going to try to do everything um, in-house, uh, is not going to proceed uh, fast enough to uh, outcompete in the in the long run uh, groups which are uh, mobile capable of uh, having many ad hoc collaborations at the same time and uh, they are uh, small groups is able to specialize in uh, uh, in certain research topic, but also is able to change that topic uh, much faster than a group of 20 people. Mm. There's one more thing about um, metrics. The complex metrics essentially create incentives to game them. Uh, they create uh, this by two mechanisms. Especially, uh, one thing is that uh, there will be low chance uh, to, uh, of being catched. The other thing is that if you are catched, the algorithm will be blamed, not you. It, it is already happening. And uh, uh, examples are ref poaching. So um, mm, please Google that uh, so you can learn what British institutions were doing uh, on the ref exercise in 2011. Uh, but also you, you have heard probably about secret uh, citation circles. Uh, as far as I know, um, uh, there is a growing consensus that people engaged in social, in secret citation cycles are not going to be punished at all. Because uh, these citations are valid, in a sense, but only they, they have only certain bias uh, in choosing which paper to cite. Uh, I'm mildly optimistic about bad things. Um, science has a um, very extensive self-correcting mechanism. So I'm kind of optimistic about all the uh, pessimistic things uh, I've mentioned so far. But there's one thing uh, um, that biologists are obsessed uh, of. Uh, it's, it's biodiversity. And um, we are afraid that if, if we let certain species extinct, uh, and because we don't know what is the role of that species in the ecosystem, uh, the ecosystem might change or collapse. And this is pretty much my, my worry when it comes to Science 2.0, and that's the only worry, 
that through globalization, the unification of research assessments and introducing algorithmic governance, which is going to be the same for all scientists uh, in the world, we are going to lose uh, this idea, idea diversity. Uh, basically, if we look at um, uh, research topics and uh, the whole spectrum and uh, the topics which are interesting, uh, worth pursuing, and there are several others which are not really interest, uh, interesting to scientific community. And if through the impact of science 2.0, the circle rotates a bit, that's actually not a big issue. The other ideas are still accessible in one form uh, or another. What I'm really afraid of is that we, uh, we introduce homogeneity uh, into scientific community, community at, at, at a such scale that we lose access to certain ideas. This goes back to, the, uh, to my experience uh, with Anglosphere uh, community and Science 2.0 over the last 10 years. So, um, I want to get it correct. Um, uh, biologists have certain ideas how to preserve biodiversity. This is uh, building natural parks and freezing. These are, these are not really applicable to humans. Um, uh, therefore, the question about preserving idea diversity, uh, how to do it, uh, is directed, uh, directed to you, to the community of social scientists. And this is the, me the message I would like to leave you with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel Stenchny, for your kind presentation. We have time for some questions. Thank you. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, I really um, like the points that you made about um, algorithmic governance and specifically um, about this issue of uh, the assessment, the ongoing assessment, um, and especially the assessment through, through metrics or through, through um, uh, complex uh, algorithms, um, introducing a sort of feedback so people start changing their behavior in order to achieve a certain result that the, the algorithm produces, and then that might sort of diverge away from what science is supposed to really achieve. And in the end, everybody gets great grades or lots of citations or great ref uh, evaluation results, but nobody's actually doing anything anything worthwhile. So um, w where do you, um, uh, how do you think that can be countered or w what should be done to avoid that in your view? Hmm. Uh, that's a really hard, qu hard question because we are pondering uh, upon, um, upon that issue for the last 10 years. And uh, uh, certainly there's no coming back to the, uh, to the old fashioned way of reading somebody's papers. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, so far, my only, um, uh, my only idea uh, for that was to preserve uh, different research assessment procedures among the countries. Uh, mm, Central and Eastern Europe, um, uh, countries from Central and Eastern Europe uh, have a very biased uh, way of um, research assessment, but um, on the other hand, this uh, occasionally produces uh, ideas which are completely uh, out, of the main, uh, out of the main track. And um, uh, if we are going to introduce the same uh, research metrics as UK, we are going to have the same ideas as well. And uh, so my only idea so far is, uh, is to use different kinds of uh, uh, research assessment procedures. Uh, this may be uh, re regional, regional or maybe um, subject specific, but 
uh, let's try not to unify everything uh, at the time. Further questions? Comments? <laughs> yeah. Just a brief comment. Uh, I know from, from reading already quite some years ago that, the, um, that it has been predicted that the uh, influence of uh, researchers or authority of researchers would, would have been questioned by media uh, competency and, and media communications. And my question towards uh, your presentation is uh, if you could give a, a quotation here or where you have uh, read this. Who was? Uh, uh, which? which? Which part? Uh, the, the, the aspect of uh, concerning authority of, of scientists at one of the uh, first slides, I think three or four. Um. Um, I don't recall. I say, said something like that. Yeah, yeah, but I <laughs> uh, okay. But uh, there is one uh, one issue that um, uh, concerning the authority of of uh, researchers. Uh, we are in Europe enjoying uh, pretty much the highest st status of science. It's not the case in, um, uh, in the US. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago on public radio, there was um, a call for listeners uh, of doing a harakiri to, to researchers because they are tools in the hands of te technocrats. This was in public radio uh, uh, in the US. The, the atmosphere against science, um, uh, the atmosphere about science is much worse in, uh, uh, in the US. And I believe this is, um, this is a reason um, we are not open enough. We are not transparent enough of um, uh, where we are heading and what we are doing. The uh, so-called climate gate, uh, this release of uh, uh, private communication about um, possible manipulation of uh, climate data, it turned out that um, there was nothing uh, wrong done, the, done over there. Uh, however, the whole story started with a, uh, with a simple fact that no data and no software that produces certain um, predictions uh, concerning climate change was freely available. You could not reproduce the, uh, uh, the data. Public has, the general public had no uh, possi possibility to verify independently what, uh, what's, what's go going there. And as a result of climate gate, uh, all major climate uh, science journals require currently uh, uh, that the software, at least the software uh, used to uh, build a certain model and do a set of predictions, uh, is available. Uh, we are kind of uh, victims of our own, own secretive behavior. <laughs>